Hi, everyone, and welcome to this special evening event with the showroom. My name is Catherine Finnerty, and I'm the co-curator of our Collective Intimacy exhibition from 2019 that took place at 180 The Strand in collaboration with Prada, The Final Factory, and artist The Astor Gates, which was a live program with over 100 multidisciplinary guests who distorted notions of selfhood and togetherness in the spirit of fostering a collaborative cosmopolitan worldview. So when we were invited to be a part of the Vav season one, the showroom decided to present a new immersive archive of this project now called Collective Intimacy Reviving a Live Program, which will be activated in a totally new way today with virtual performances from some of our amazing original collaborators. So after an intro from my colleague, director Elvira Diangani Ose, and a video trailer from the Collective Intimacy Program from 2019. I'll take you all on a little virtual tour of our exhibition on the VOV, followed by this brilliant lineup of screenings, performances, talks, and music. So at 6.15, we'll play the new video Temenos by producer Nefertiti Aboshi Shandor, followed by spoken word by violinist Blaze Henry, at 6.30, the video In Praise of Still Boys and a discussion with poet Julia Knox. At 6.45, a screening by Postscript titled On Cultural Self-Reclamation and the Female Gaze with founder Chinasa Chukwu in conversation with co-founder and editorial director Elvira Vedelego and filmmaker Sis Girdle. And finally, at 7.30 p.m., we'll immerse ourselves in the video Mother Tongue, Mother Master, and a closing sound session by artist Phoebe Collins James. So just a huge thank you to all of these incredible artists and our partners at the VOV for making this possible. And now here's Alvira to tell you a bit more about the Collective Intimacy Project. Hello everyone, my name is Elvira Jangani Ose and I'm the director and chief curator of the showroom in London. I'm here with my colleague, curator Catherine Finerty, and we are thrilled to welcome you to Collective Intimacy, reviving a live program in the world. At the showroom, we are all passionate about innovating our archive into a dynamic and immersive space accessible to wider future audiences. Through this expansive collaboration with the world, we hope that collective intimacy is radical togetherness and is connection and appeal to present black aesthetics and narrative will resonate in a moment where activists and allies across the globe have been protesting against unrelenting racial violence. A way to reflect on how the anti-racist movements, COVID-19 pandemic have further exposed resisting struggle and disparities in our communities and for culture makers, it is our hope that this project in its virtual and fluid context will extend its capacity to connect and amplify a myriad of voices. We hope that the energy and solidarity, the love for creating that some of us share then and now will somehow reverberate and touches and overcome the limits of your screen. Please um, enjoy. Thank you so much to the Bob, to everyone that participated in Collective Intimacy two years ago and here uh, for bringing this platform alive, for bringing us all together. If you have seen the film, just snap your fingers for me. Yes, of slavery. 
So hi again, everyone. I hope that gave you a good sense of the spirit and energy of this project. And now I'll just share my screen for our tour. Okay, so now we're on the Volved Art Art, and here is the Collective Intimacy page where you can enter the virtual exhibition here. And again, we're just so thrilled um, to have this project expanded on the VOV, which is this new virtual arts platform um, that brings together 14 other institutions um, to bring art to life through a virtual landscape. And you are more than welcome, as you see here on the right, to donate. The contributions are all spread throughout the different institutions, and there's more details about that online. So here we go. Right now, we're on the main stage, which you might remember from when we entered the trailer. This is where a lot of the performances took place, but now we have a new video on the stage, which is called Lumen by Nefertiti Aboshi Shandorf. This work was inspired by her original performance called Suspiro, which was actually a two hour presentation that featured violinist um, Blaise Henry, who will later perform um, shortly after this tour, as well as two sopranos and a um, meditation and a general focus on Jasmine, actually, this flower that blooms in the evening and represents um, love and serenity. So we've taken a little bit of an inspiration to have a um, cocktail or tea time, if you would like. The program is going to be for two hours, so please feel free to grab a drink or some snacks. When Suspira was originally um, performed at 180 The Strand in October, 2019, we had Jasmine tea served. So if you have that or that suits your fancy, please grab some tea. Um, for the opening at Freeze Week, we also did have cocktails. So if you're in the mood for something stronger, we served a Yuzu Collins, um, which is made out of vodka, soda water, Jasmine tea again on theme and yuzu. But if you do not have yuzu as a staple in your fridge, which I sadly don't today, should work on that. Um, you can also just use some lemon or lime or orange. That'll do the job really nicely. Um, okay, so let's just take a little look around before we start our program tonight. And here is a side room that's curated by collective Thicker Black Lines. Here we have an intro video to their work by Rihanna Jade Parker on the left and Arella Youssef. Their Zoom intro is about this screening, Black British Women Femme Filmmakers. And there are two works actually in this space. Here on the left, we have Emily Molinga's For Survival for Pleasure. And across from it, there is Cecile Emeka's Here Now Then What? So then we go back into the main space and on the left side, we have a few more videos, all from artists again, who are in the original program in 2019. So here is Julia Knox's Roots for a Crown. And again, Julian will be presenting a newer film alongside discussion and poetry later. Here, we have a work on the left by Larry Aponsa, looking for sugar in the ocean, who is the enemy? And to the right, Andrew Pierre Hartz. The grid always appears. And again, you can watch all of these in this virtual space um, anytime for the next few weeks. Down here, we have two works by Phoebe Boswell. This is the Lighthouse 2, which is a, a group performance. And the original one, the Lighthouse 1, also accompanied by her video piece, Yithla. And now, finally, we come to one more work in the space here, which is Temenos by Nefertiti Aboshi Shandorf, again, featuring violinist Blaise Henry. So, um, as I mentioned, this is going to be the first work in our program. Um, 
Tamanos was actually the fourth work that Nefertiti collaborated with violinist Blaze, inviting him to respond to different prompts. And this improvised performance is a continuation of the themes of alchemy and Jungian thought instigated in Negredo, which was the sister piece and originator of Suspiro, both which were from 2019, and Lumen, which was that newly commissioned work for the Vav that was on the main stage that we saw. Um, in this piece, which I'm so proud to say was newly commissioned this year and actually filmed in the showroom itself in April, which is such a, a beautiful experience considering uh, we weren't able to safely gather in that space for a while. Um, and here you'll see Blaze interpreting the motif of temenos, which in Greek means a sacred space. And he also responded to the ambient sounds of the external world to construct this meditative work. Um, Blaise Henry was born to Afro-Guyanese parents in Southeast London and has been playing the violin since he was seven. He now enjoys a very career as an orchestral musician, chamber music player and teacher, regularly playing with the orchestra Chineke. And as an artist and composer, he enjoys blending a broad range of musical genres and mediums to create complex, luscious soundscapes. And his most recent performance art pieces, like what we'll see after Terminos, uses spoken word, but also improvisation, jazz harmony, and digital manipulation to explore themes such as race, gender, sexuality, and desire in an increasingly divided world. Um, so please sit back and enjoy um, the first live segment of our program, which is a 13 minute screening of Temenos, followed by spoken word by Blaise Henry. Ready, ready? ready.
What do we define as sacred? What should I feel as I walk the earth, not sure of where I belong? What do we find as sacred? Where should I stand when I hear injustice? Where should I look to confront my own demons? What should I do when I look in the mirror and no longer recognize my own reflection? What do we define as sacred? Is it here where I sit, where I stand, how I reveal myself to the world? When I speak on behalf of others, can my words be sacred when I purposely leave so much left unspoken? Who do I consider sacred? My mother, my father, those who carried me into the world, or my ancestors who sustained me through it? Their care wrapped around me graciously, even when I rejected it. What do I consider sacred? The moments where I finally feel whole, where the warmth from the scan of my skin collide, where I sit, where I stand, where I accept myself, my fullest self, where I create, where I dare to dream, when I shine as bright as I ever thought possible. Thank you. Thank you so much to Blaze for kickstarting our evening tonight. Um, again, it was such an honor commissioning this new work with you, and especially as well to our dear friend Nefertiti Oboshi Shandorf, who um, produced and created that video Temenos, and for inviting Blaze to reflect on that word and what a sacred space um, means to him. So. Next up, we have Julia Knox, who's an interdisciplinary poet, visual artist, and filmmaker, whose practice crosses the boundaries of the written word, music, visual art, and installation. He explores themes of inheritance, loss, and belonging, their effects on personal and interpersonal narratives, and their capacity to deconstruct dominant perspectives on African culture and reposition ourselves with new collective narratives. So Julian's video work from last year in praise of still boys is a re-examination of his childhood growing up in Sierra Leone through the lives and experiences of young boys living and growing next to the blue waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The visual poem transports us back through the poet's past with the inclusion of Creole, an English-based Creole language spoken mainly in Sierra Leone. In this video, Julian imagines a space where young Sierra Leoneans can try to write their own stories into a global history, expressing local worldviews through the imagery of the Atlantic Ocean. The film meditates on change, fate, and everyday magic, exploring the relationship between Freetown, the Middle Passage, and the African diaspora. So please enjoy a four minute screening of In Praise of Still Boys, which will be followed by a short discussion between me and Julian and the poem Creo. Hello there. Where I get you, Billy? I was on contraceptive. So, going to three months, now I notice uh, I was not feeling normal. Boss, we should say I'm pregnant. I didn't tell her, I said, no, I say I get called. I say, there is no call, my dear, you are pregnant. But I could not have the money. The money was not even there. If I go get rid of the pregnancy. <laughs> On the first of March, in Liverpool, that night, they wrapped you up and told me the money. If I came to the theater for go check me. I will see what we are going to look for. See, I tell them, say, ah, will you not make me April full? Now I say that the baby make you April full, not only make you April full, oh, this baby here. Yeah. Now I wise pass you. Now I make you April full. I say how? Then they say they see the hole on your palm. So you came with the protection because you want to see the world. That was all about your stories with that. <laughs> but I love you. Still boys filled with water Have lived on cliffs too long to learn the dangers what waters bring These boys swim with flames Hungry for new language They've studied their borders The things holding them 
they dipped off the rock, rode the waves on a two-legged blue horse. There are several ways to escape this spell. The first time I saw the ocean through the window of a plane, I wonder how we could hold all those black bodies, the sky, a featureless spectacle, this new middle passage, moving us to sub in this place, a sacrament deferred singing. You are what's left of us, saying you are what's left of us, saying you are what's left of us. A hymn of dead doves, the ocean, a cracked chandelier where the dead praise their grave. Other days I wear the blue flood on my shoulder thinking too much on things people would love to see drown. Draining the idea to see what struggling looks like when all we needed was breath. Hey, Julian. Hi, Catherine. How are you? I'm really good. It's such a pleasure, as always, to watch your work. One in the virtual exhibition and now one that we get to, you know, surprise people with in the live event. Um, so let's jump right in. In praise of Still Boys, I would love to know what originally made you um, dream up this new ambitious work? Um, I guess it's about, I, I don't know, as, an, as, as artists, we want to tell our stories. We want to sell, we want to tell stories of some sorts um, about whatever we experience or the things that we have that we feel like the world needs to hear. Um, yeah, I guess it started from that, wanting to tell a Sierra Leonean narrative and finding a way in was through writing these poems. And then um, eventually um, figuring out how we then find a way in visually. Mm. I had the opportunity to go to Sierra Leone. So then that was a good um, way in to that. But then also um, it's collecting um, conversations, you know? Mm. Um, this is something that I do. I collect um, conversations from families and friends and um, go through them when I can and find a way to respond to them. And the opening scene, you have my mom um, talking about my birth story. Um, and that was really intriguing to me. <laughs> Did you know um, it before she shared it with you for this like interview process? I'll say that again, sorry. Did you know that story, the details of it before you asked her about it for this video? No, not at all. Wow. Um, yeah, not at all. She, um, yeah, she never shared it with me. And I just asked her and then she said, this is your story. And I thought, I know the perfect place for this one. <laughs> and it ended up being in the film. So yeah, it all came through finding and I guess finding way in to tell a Sierra Leonean narrative, a worldview from, I guess, a Sierra Leonean perspective. Mm. I love when you were saying as well that such a key part of your practice is thinking of an oral communication and how that translates visually. And I, I think it comes across so strongly in this film, the color blue, the water and the ancestral 
journeys that is born so deep in it, but especially this idea of, of language and how language is not only spoken, but also read and that kind of dissonance between um, orality and history and language and writing. So especially considering this introduction with your, your mother and your birth story, I'm sure it's in the Creole that um, you're focusing on. I'm wondering why did you decide not to translate that bit? That bit's just in, you know. Yeah. Um, so a few things. One of them was um, I tried to do it and it came across a lot harsher um, than, yeah, just it wasn't what my mom was saying when mm -hmm. I translated. Um, just the way the tone um, changed, the, yeah, just everything changed, the mannerism, the approach. There was, there's a closeness, you know, to how she told me the story. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, she just said it in that kind of sense. And when I tried to put in English, even trying to write a poem to respond to it. Um, it was very, uh, it wasn't truthful. Yeah. It wasn't honest. And I think keeping it um, in the sort of Creole language, keeping it as she's saying it, kind of in a way preserve the emotion, it preserves um, the connection, the intimacy, and I guess the truth that she's trying to um, communicate. And I wanted that emotion to come across. So that was the way I kind of decided that maybe this is for, this is for Creos. Like if you're, yeah, like, yeah this is for Creos. And also um, just making a film about Sierra Leonean and trying to um, take it away from them was, was another thing that I was thinking about. How do we, how do I, how can I make a film about you know, Sierra Leoneans are all about my story and then take it away from them or from myself, um, I think is a bit rude. So I thought I'll keep it honest. Yeah, well, it's good. It's so cool to hear as well, that sense of like agility and just paying attention to like the texture and the sincerity of a feeling and then going with that. I mean, with language, especially, it is so nuanced. It is so subjective and personal, you know, if you're not actually listening to it, then you're losing um, so much the heart of it. Um, and especially thinking about like nuance and textures. I know actually that this project is not just a single screen four minute video, which we were um, lucky to see to get today. That's a little bit of a, a taster and it's actually this much more expansive, immersive project, not just in terms of being research-based, but multiple videos, different lengths, different screens. And it's actually gonna finally come to fruition later this year um, in an exhibition at 180 The Strand where we first met and worked together. So that's pretty cool. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, what to expect from that aspect of the project. Yeah, um, so in gathering the, risk, the research for it, um, yeah, I just have a lot, a lot in the, in a bag <laughs> um, and when we put yeah just putting it together I think firstly I put it out as just like a smaller piece um, because um, I just this idea with my practice I always want to do an online edition um, just because my younger self I'd want them to see what I do because often we um, just keep these works in a gallery and um, if you're not in that world, you miss it. Yeah. And um, I didn't want to just shoot these boys and then just keep it for just, yeah, the Western gaze. So I wanted to put it online so that they can access it and see mm -hmm. themselves um, how I've shot them. And I wanted them to know that, you know, I've taken care. Hopefully they, they, they're aware of that. Um, and then on, in trying to, I guess, reimagine it in a space, it was like, how do I um, create a sense of a little bit of Sierra Leone? Not in, not like I'm saying this is Sierra Leone, but just a little bit of it, you know, mm. um, and in a space and knowing that um, there's this layering of like, you know, the image, the poetry, the music, the dance, the archives, 
it, it was it was kind of yeah my decision was to kind of open into like three channel mm. um and i felt like that gives a more sort of immersive immersive um yeah vibe to it amazing i love your phrase everyday magic it sounds like this multi-layered approach to displaying the work will really capture that. I can't wait. Um, as soon as we know the dates, we'll be sure to like blast it on our channels so everyone can go and see it in that other um, layer. But before we wrap up today, there's one particular poem of yours in relation to this video that we'd love to share with our audiences in this virtual space. So if you wouldn't mind, please ending your session with the poem Creo. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for having me. Always, Julian. Um, yeah, so this is Creo. To be Creo is to know life. It's full of impossible unicorns in the rainforest, the sketch of an ocean. We came here by order of lost clocks to kickstart time before Africa was another world. To be Creo is to know the place before us. Children missing from wombs, stories, mouths keeping wool, a place where the sun empties itself over the black of bodies. To be Creo is to know history, it's a sliced violence. On the tip of a Yoruba tongue, at Kiryo, aimless yet satisfied wanderers, to be born dotted around the blue, mist moving lips, recalling from swords, bullets, cannon fodder, to make your house in a nation unclear. To be Creole is to be boundless, fragment of their Africa, permanent shape in the Atlantic's belly, waiting to spill their ghost, to mourn identity, a hard freedom, a new world with black of the ancient. There will be no fire bringing us back. Who invents beginnings anyway? I plant a seed to lift to death a killing of birth. To be Creo is to be a clamor in the revolution. Shaping time, dreaming inside a strange thing. They blind your past and you, and you shape a garden with your eyes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julian. And can't wait to see um, this body of work evolve at 180 The Strand later this year. Don't be a stranger. Keep us posted <laughs> on when we can all get over there. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so now we have a special screening program hosted by Postscript. This is um, one of the longer programs we'll be having for the next 40 minutes. So again, if you did take me out, but my suggestion to grab a cup of tea or a cocktail and some snacks, feel free to refill as I introduce it. Um, it's titled On Cultural Self-Reclamation and the Female Gaze. Postscript is a cultural anthology launched in 2018, releasing new issues biannually that explore critical thought from contemporary women. They aim to produce inspiring and informative context, reframing women in contemporary conversations, merging well-researched analytical writing with evocative artistic expressions, centering on a singular theme per issue. So this special event today brings together female artists, creative directors, and filmmakers whose works explore and deconstruct stereotypical and non-contextual tropes of femininity, identity, and cultural influences. We'll start by expanding upon the conversations from Postscript's recent film, English Rose, directed by Remy Laudit for issue three which addresses presentations of womanhood and beauty. And it'll be accompanied by a conversation with Postscript's founder, Chinasa Chukwu, and co-founder and editorial director, Elvira Vedelego. Next, we'll have a second screening featuring Postcards from the Orient by Sis Gardel, who's a filmmaker, and this film presents a surreal reimagining, highlighting the problematic representation of Middle Eastern women in Orientalist art. And this will be followed by a discussion um, between Chinasa and Sis. So now please first enjoy the four minute screening of English Rose followed by a conversation. I cut it for the first time three years ago. And then my ex broke up with me because he didn't like my hair. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't find me attractive anymore. Everyone deals with their hair journey differently during chemo. I found that you either cut it off quite quickly or you 
held onto every single strand. At first it was a bob, and then from a bob, like, I was just, I just, I don't know, I just felt ballsy. I was like, do it, let's do it, do it. I can't remember why I did it. I've been talking about doing it for like a year, and I was like, okay, if I wanted to do it for a year, then that means I should just do it now. Kept it short, because I was like, if I grow it back, then I'm giving in to the conformity of what someone else wants of me. I, I wear a lot of men's clothes and I don't wear a bra. And, but I've always done that. It's just weird that now I'm getting different energy or perceptions back. My mum was the one that took it the hardest. Cause obviously like a big part of like Asian identity is like your hair. Being Muslim, South Asian and being bold, I feel like that in itself, I'm non-conforming. And I really take pride in that. I've been lately thinking that I'm not sure how feminine I feel, but I also really want to feel feminine. But I don't know whether it is my hair stopping me from that or what it is. And even though I'm, I'm Indian heritage, like hair is still a massive part of the culture anyways. And I think she still struggles with that like ideal of a daughter with long hair. I feel like it's very rare for an Asian mother to be okay with their daughter having short hair. With South Asians, it's very much like long hair and fair skin it means you're beautiful. And I just don't agree with it. I've had so many girls that are Bengali or South Asian. You look so good rocking this look. Well, I wish I could. I was like, yeah, you can. Everyone feels femininity in a different way. Everyone, exper everyone expresses it differently. At the beginning it was like I'd wear makeup every day if I couldn't leave the house without wearing makeup. So I had to, yeah, obviously overcompensate. I'm basically trying to not accessorise too much or use those makeup to show my femininity, but more just be confident in myself that I have it. I don't even shave my legs anymore. I appreciate that it's not ugly, like I really like it. Just becoming at peace with like being bold and still being Bengali, just having those two things coexist and being okay with that and knowing that that is okay and possible. Why do we have to be like, oh, I'm either super girly or tomboy? Like, why are there two options? And why can't it change daily as well, or hourly, or whatever you want? Or why can't you, like, I just feel like I'm a mirror and that's who I want to be. And I just express myself however I want all the time. I don't think it matters whether I have long hair, short hair, I'm slim, big, fat, short, fair, like whatever. Like I'm still a woman, I'm still South Asian. And femininity is what you make it. Hi, um, hello everyone. I'm Chinasa and I'm joined by my co-founder Elvira as we discuss her film, English Rose. Um, Elvira, thank you for sharing your film with us. I'm sure everyone watching can agree that it is a beautiful portrayal of South Asian women and their relationship with their hair and femininity. I have some questions for you now as I'd love to learn a little bit more about your process when making the film. So okay, the first, question is why did you decide to name your film English Rose? Um, yeah we uh, I get asked that question a bit um, uh, naturally but I think um, when we first created the film English Rose wasn't the name that we were going to call it and um, we had another name in mind and when I suggested English Rose to the team and um, I remember we had a lot of interesting conversations about um, that name and it, I guess of uh, who gets to claim Englishness, um, particularly as people of colour um, in Britain being born in England. Um, so, but that there was a, a lot of very interesting conversations on that, but I think um, the reason why I personally um, wanted that name is I really wanted to think about um, what we understand of that term. Um, if you think that the, the term English rose is kind of like a, a really high form of praise and a, a big compliment that you might give to a woman in this country and um, perhaps a bit outdated now but at one time it was a, a really big um, compliment to say that to a woman to be like um, to praise them for their womanliness or being a lady um, and I really just wanted to subvert what we understand of that term so if you think of the kind of visual images and representations that 
come to mind with those terms are a woman who is very slender and um, very fair and has hair um, and if you even if you do a google search you'll the the women that come up are women like Kira Knightley or Gemma Artisan and um, maybe even Sienna Miller uh, so it's a very specific type of woman and I really wanted to challenge that with this film and to um, ask the viewer to consider what they understand of the term and what they understand of the social standards that we hold women to um, and who gets to fit into um, the ideal of what a woman should look like in this country and then as well um, uh, put the women featured in this film on a kind of equal level with the the terms that we use for being beautiful um, in this country. I love that. Um, I do remember these conversations and I love that you didn't actually put a question mark at the end of the at the end of the title. It's just it's a statement, even though it is uh, challenging perceptions. Um, so my next question, you're you're a Nigerian Italian mixed race woman. Why did you decide to make a film about the relationship between Asian women's hair, femininity and cultural identity? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, so we didn't actually, again, <laughs> didn't really start out with that as the plan. I think it, we kind of got there as I uh, developed the concept a little bit more, but um, the initial idea for this film was to have, um, to create a short film that would have different women from different backgrounds talking about their relationship with hair. Um, and it was important for me to do that reflecting on my own relationship with hair. Um, from a very young age, I realized that hair was a real marker of femininity and um, getting comments from everywhere I went about me having good hair, which is really just a translation for what the hair that is socially acceptable um, in Western settings particularly. So thinking about that and, and understanding that, and then also having um, my best friend a couple of years ago who is um, Spanish, she, she decided to shave off her hair for personal reasons. Um, and it was a really liberating experience for her, but at the same time, she kind of had to navigate um, how people interacted with her in social settings. So getting a lot more stares, getting people assuming that she's sick and even a change in um, her dating options as a result of that when nothing had changed for her personally or, or anything about her had changed apart from just um, not having hair anymore. <laughs> um, so because of that, I started to have further conversations with other friends and who had shaved their hair as well. And, and seeing this pattern um, for them experiencing this change in the way people interacted with them and engaged with them. I think one family friend once said to me that her mom cried when she shaved off her head. Um, she got on board later, but um, yeah, she kind of cried and, and there was this big um, almost scene for this moment when she revealed her new um, hairdo. So really that was where I kind of wanted to create this film to, to have these conversations and to challenge what we understand about um, femininity. Because again, my, my friend, my uh, Spanish friend, she felt like even though this was a huge thing, not a huge thing for her, but a really liberating thing for her she also felt like the world saw her as less of a woman as a result and um, so really wanted to explore that in this film um, and as I said it was supposed to be uh, different women but as I started to um, put uh, the cast together and, and talk to women about their experiences I felt like the the differences in cultural expectations or the cult cultural significances that were placed on hair from all these women's different backgrounds and um, doing a three-minute film just didn't do justice to kind of explore that in, in depth and um, the ideal was to separate out and have a series and um, explore uh, British women from South Asian backgrounds in one film and then maybe look at Latina women in another film and then maybe look at um, women from the Middle East but uh, we didn't quite get there and the money became an issue as well <laughs> um, so yeah we started with uh, with um, this film talking about um, South Asian women's relationship with her. But of course, even just hearing these women talk, there's so many parallels that can be drawn um, from my own experiences and from various women's, uh, various women from different backgrounds with their experiences as well. So it worked out in the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for expanding on that. Um, so the voices of the different women in the film can be heard playing over the visuals and lend a very intimate tone to the film. Was it important to have their voices specifically rather than a voiceover, for instance? Um, and if so, why? Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really think about that too much in the beginning. It just felt really natural for them to tell their own stories um, in, in their voice because I, how they all came to um, shaving off their hair was all, it was all different routes. So um, 
one of the, one of the girls might have done it for um, a show of their like personal expression or their identity, and, a, and another girl might have done it as a result of sickness. So it just made sense that they would speak about their own experiences and the differences of those experiences in their own voice. I also think it's really powerful not to because you could have transcribed it and then you know you could have read it over or had someone else. So I, I think there's a real power to them uh, being the ones, as you said. Um, telling their stories the way that they want to tell it without any editing, without any um, yeah. outside interpretation of what they meant. Yeah, um, they claim it for themselves. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, through the creative and filmmaking process, did you learn anything new about your cultural identity? Um, that's a good question. Did I learn anything new? I think what I really uh learned or I, it kind of became even clearer for me was really about my relationship with hair um, and as I said earlier this whole phrasing of of me having good hair but really the undertone of that is good hair for a woman of color and um, so the way people react to me um no, the way that my hair kind of shapes my interactions with people and actually coming to the realization that even though I don't place a huge significance on my hair, I don't really do anything with it, put it up in a bun or put it up in a ponytail and like it's not that an, an important part of my identity. Um, and as much as I might trivialize it, the reality is because I have what society or Western society in particular might um, see as more socially acceptable palatable hair um, I actually am able to move through the world much easier um, in work situations um, in dating situations um, and that's something that like maybe I wasn't I didn't think about too much that actually this thing on my head <laughs> um, makes my life a little bit easier as a woman of color that it doesn't block me in certain respects and I don't have to think I don't have to think about it I don't have that additional challenge whereas um, other women might have to. Um, okay, and then finally, what do you want audiences to take away from the film, if anything in particular? Yeah, um, I guess I've maybe touched on it already a little bit, but just really wanting to open up more dialogue like this to, to have conversations about what we understand of beauty, femininity and womanhood, um, what, what social standards we hold uh, women to in terms of beauty and femininity. Um, but again, I guess also like where we see these standards reinforced with this film in particular, um, we, uh, being a film that focuses on British women of South Asian descent, we wanted to pull in references in the style of the film, pull in references of Bollywood. Um, because if you think about uh, that industry being a, like that, just being absolutely huge, um, particularly for South Asian audiences. And then thinking about the women that you see in that film and the it again, fitting a certain kind of mold and with this massive industry and um, having a very specific type of leading lady and giving off the message that this is the pinnacle, this is the ideal of what a woman um, should look like. And so really wanting to challenge that in this film and then open up more dialogue that you know would work to deconstruct I guess stereotypical um, understandings of feminine beauty yeah. thank you I think you I think you definitely did that and and using that um style of visual language created a really interesting contrast um, which in and of itself, even if you didn't have the words, even if you didn't have um, any of the models speaking and telling their stories, in and of itself told that story and asked those questions and invites the viewer to ask themselves what their perceptions of, of femininity mm -hmm. um, is and how, and the role that hair does play in that, particularly in Western, in Western context. So yeah, obviously I love it, which you already know. Um, Thank you. <laughs> that, was, that was my final question. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, Thank you for having me. Um, <laughs> okay, I will let you get on to the next part of this bit. Thank, Thank you. you, bye. <laughs> bye. Um, now could the Vov please play postcards from the Orient before we sit down with Sis Gada.
we did not fail to smile as he entered. The man who speaks not our language, examining the arches around our walls. Bearing the prophecies of our fortune, he whispered intimate tales of the Orient, but forgot to probe into the Orioles of our souls. I am unsure whether to regard him as our guest or host. He speaks intimate tales of women ornaments, reds, citruses, and cavities. He does not forget to probe. He decides not to see. Past his roaring retreat, all is intact. Sisters and daughters slumber. Hi, sis. Hi. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very happy to be here. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing postcards from the Orient with us. It's a truly mesmerizing yet subversive depiction of Middle Eastern women's sexuality and a cultural identity. So I have a lot of questions. So to get straight into it, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to make postcards from the Orient? Yeah, sure. I mean, I was researching the colonialist gaze and more specifically how the formation of the Eastern woman um, came into context in Orientalist artwork, specifically in my native country in Turkey. And the representation of the Eastern woman in general, more specifically through Western art, is very much a blurred line between fantasy and reality. So in the context of the Ottoman Empire, for example, Western artists were commissioned to paint um, the women of the harem, which is um, the many wives of the Sultan. And they would actually not be allowed in these spaces where the women lived. So what they would do oftentimes is to hire women from the streets and ask them to pose for them uh, for money. And they would, you know, imagine these scenarios where they live in really luxurious lives, eating fruits, bathing, just only enjoying and having a pleasurable experience. Um, and these portraits ended up in museums all across the world and they actually are still representing Eastern women um, globally. So for me, I was thinking about how the depiction of the Oriental woman in art isn't just about the other, it's more about how the Western artist positions himself as the desired, the person you know, who is making these paintings. So, um, the West is inherently advanced and the East is suppressed uh, behind and underdeveloped. That's the dynamic that creates this artwork. Um, so there's a lot of material in academia about this, but obviously we can hear from the subjects of this artwork and the women who are painted remain in the center of the discussion as voiceless subjects. Um, so as a tribute to these women um, who have been misrepresented, I really wanted to make this film and I wanted to give them a voice. I love that. That was actually one of my questions. Elvira and I obviously spoke earlier about the importance of the female voice in projects like these. Um, for me, um, as for you, it sounds like part, part of Postcards from the Orient Subversion is through the voice speaking throughout. Um, was it important, obviously you've just said it, you wanted to give them a voice, but was it important for you um, to have the voice carry on throughout rather than, for instance, having an instrumental play and having a voice for a section? Yeah, I mean, um, 
for me, it was a really important part of the project to create a dissonance between what we're seeing and what we're hearing. And um, for the spoken word, I collaborated with uh, writer Mei Ziaude, who did an amazing job um, and elevated the project by giving it such a strong voice. Um, the narration is actually the only way we hear the perspective of the women. So um, it's an essential part of it for me. Um, and May did a lot of research going into it um, to look through all the literature um, that represented these women from a Western perspective. So it was kind of like an answer to all of that. Um, so I think that having that um, kind of clash between what we're hearing and what we're seeing is, is essential because that's how it should work, right? We, we should hear the voices of the people we're seeing um, being talked about, posted about, written about, and there's always a dissonance between those things. Um, and, and that's based on how we see and how we choose to see. So um, I feel like the voiceover was a very, very important part of the project. That's very cool. Thank you. Um, I did think um, I did think it mattered, obviously, but hearing about the kind of research that Mays uh, put into it, I think, gives it a even gives it an even added uh, complexity and makes the work even more layered. I think than perhaps would be obvious at first glance. Um, so, postcards from the Orient, as you've noted, is a critique of colonialist portrayals of uh, Middle Eastern women. Do you feel like? as an individual, your sexual or cultural identity is something you've had to reclaim from this damaging portrayal? Um, and if so, it's kind of a question in two parts. And if so, how has that related to your personal ideas of femininity, womanhood or sensuality? Yeah, I mean, I think that at its core, Postcards from the Orient is about the act of defining identity. and. For me, the most challenging part of defining my womanhood had to do with how it relates to finding my position in society um, because of the way that womanhood is taught. And I've experienced that in different cultures and received clashing ideas of what that should mean. Um, so what I mean is you're taught to think and feel in specific ways, um, usually depending on your culture. And um, that points to certain aspects about uh, right and wrong. Um, so I think that the biggest thing that I've had to reclaim was that blank canvas um, to build my own idea of what it means to be a woman. Um, so I think that that's actually what the film talks about um, and what it reclaims as well, so to speak, um, that we need to define femininity and womanhood on our own terms. Lovely, thank you for expanding um, and for being so open as well. Um, though postcards from the Orient to speak a little bit now about the the visuals that, that you use to to convey this message though postcards from the Orient takes on a visual language that is reminiscent of colonial orientalist um, depictions the film itself obviously subverts those stereotypes of Middle Eastern women's sexuality and daily life as you've pointed out can you tell us a little bit about why you chose to use this approach rather than create a film with an entirely different visual style. Yeah, I mean, going into this, I felt like the film wouldn't be effective if it was done any differently than how we as an audience recognize this imagery. Um, we had to recreate that those specific paintings that were focused on these women as sexual ob objects. And um, by doing this, we would be creating a sense of familiarity and then try to destroy it as much as possible throughout the voiceover. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously without being too derogatory, but we're trying to break down the film um, by using the perspective of that Western audience. We needed to recreate that sense of otherness and um, for that exercise to work. So the aesthetic remained the same, but we also used um, other things like the score, the camera work and the art to really just try and um, convey the idea that there is something else going on here um, that you should be paying attention to. There was also a separate part of this project, um, which is a small detail, but we sculpted parts of the women's bodies in the project. And this was kind of also to highlight the fact that, you know, um, anything that specifically portrays these women as sensual objects instead of human beings, um, 
is the way that they're going down in history through these um, paintings. So I think that recreating it was a bigger part of the challenge, but it was also, you know, our goal at the end of the day. I love that. I love that there are so many that that postcards for me certainly is is the film is a film that you come back to in many different ways and you and there's always something else for you to uncover um and some other uh concept or message that you haven't quite picked up maybe uh because you're right if you do watch it for instance with with the sound off it's it can feel like an entirely different film and then you switch on the music and you listen to what's actually being said you could watch it the first time and not listen to what's being said and completely miss um, that dissonance that you're trying to achieve. Um, okay, so what sensitivities, if any, did you have to be aware of? Obviously, we're talking about um, subverting that Western gaze and, as you said, uh, breaking it down, uh, breaking down those tropes completely through the film. What sensitivities, if any, did you have to be aware of while making the film um, in the industry and then, I'd say, in society in general. Um, you're Turkish, for instance, but you made the film in New York. Was there a reason for that? Yeah, I mean, I think that you always need to be extremely sensitive to your own voice when you're representing someone other than just yourself. Um, for me, this was essential in keeping the film truthful. And, you know, when it specifically comes to critiquing another perspective, which is what this film is based on, I felt like I had to be extra sensitive that it wasn't, um, making accusations um, and that it was just questioning things because I don't believe in the fact that we should be thinking for ourselves, we should asking, we should ask the audience to think for themselves. So in, in that sense, it was always just inviting the audience to ask those questions. And I think that was a really um, tricky part of the project because we're making all these grand statements and surely we're setting a tone and we're suggesting and we're hinting at a lot of things but um, I think in that way putting these projects out there is to do more um, than just raising your voice I think um, that I was very aware of so we stated facts history real events um, but but subtlety was essential in that um, and in the sense of why we shot in New York I think that there were certain dynamics that needed to be recreated. For example, if I'm doing this in Turkey, I think that creating that sense of otherness would have been much more difficult for me. Whereas I was doing it in New York um, and I was recreating the perspective of a Western artist. So in that sense, um, really just essentially creating that Occident perspective, it was essential. Thank you. Um, and my final question now, I mean, thank you for expanding so much um, on the complexities involved in creating the development of the film. Um, but my final question is the same as the one I asked Elvira. What do you want audiences to take away from the film? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to ask anyone to take anything <laughs> away from <laughs> my film, but I can say that my biggest takeaway from making this film was to look at um, my own way of seeing and how that might misrepresent something or someone um, because the biggest theme for the film is how misrepresentation happens and that's where um, a lot of hearts get broken and um, I think that's where we need to pay attention the most. Amazing thank you so much sis. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. That is actually the end of our program um also i can't wait to see what else you have on the horizon sis so please do keep us updated and we'll of course share it with with our audience um i'm gonna hand over to catherine really quickly because i think she wants to say something yeah i know it's just to kind of thank you both while you're still on the screen um Tunas and Elvira, it's so great collaborating with you guys again, and especially for this unique um, screening focusing on defiance and individuality and the representation of womanhood and femininity, which Elvira and Sis, your, um, your films execute so aesthetically beautifully, but also very provocatively. And that was such a great pairing. And thank you, Chinasa, for contextualizing it. I also just wanted to mention that Postscript's newest issue, number four, Reverie, is out now. So we encourage everyone to check it out online. Um, so yeah, thank you both so much and see you soon. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Okay, so now we are gearing up for our last session, 
we have a special screening and unique sound set by artist Phoebe Colling James for the next 30 minutes. Phoebe's work often eludes linear retellings of stories, instead speaking of knowledges of feelings, the debris of violence, language and desire, which are all inherent to living and surviving within hostile environments. Her practice also encompasses ceramic forms and sound design for original music productions. And she is a part of the collective BOSS, a QTI BIPOC sound system based in South London. So her three minute 16 millimeter video work, Mother Tongue, Mother Master from 2018 exposes the erotics of shame and the access it bears within the body. The voice is bound by constraints put onto the body and its histories exploring the possibility of subjecthood, agency, and resistance from the starting point of born objecthood and commodity. So following this screening is also a never before experienced sound work through walking and talking called, Can You Move Towards Yourself Without Flinching? For this rare solo audio release, Phoebe lays out overlaps and tangles, a curious and often contradictory selection of material over a bed of slowly tumbling electronics. She says it's like picking up someone's phone and briefly eavesdropping on their photos, their diary notes, recordings. Not sure if you've done that or not, but this is what it'll feel like. What have they been watching or listening to? It's all rendered in an oral tapestry with a bracing question. Like her recent collaborative work, Sound as Weapon, Sounds for Survival, with last year's Interesting Negro, Phoebe's placement and arrangement of audio is masterful in its sleight of hand, which always invites numerous interpretations without losing its ability to beguile. So now we welcome you all to the last session of our program, an immersive experience of Phoebe's works, starting with her two minute video, Mother Tongue, Mother Master, followed by this new sound set for the next 30 minutes.
You work with my mum, yeah? Yeah. Not on the machine. No. You coming round tomorrow night, Paul? Mum. Hey? We're going out. Wouldn't come round before, and won't you? Have a drink. It's her 21st. It's no big deal. Well, I ain't give you your yeah. present yet. Chicken drumsticks. Some salad, sweetheart. Yes, please. I'll get you some. Are you doing something special tomorrow night, you two? No, I don't a pub as usual. Oh. Do you use fingers? Use what you like. Use your feet if you want. <laughs> You've had no fun part there, Jean. It's a bit late now. What do you do at the factory then? This looks really lovely, Morris. Thank you. I hope it doesn't kill you. <laughs> the salad service here, Cynthia. You ain't no boss, are you? No. Yeah, sweetheart. Thank you. Do you want some salad, Paul? No, I'm all right, thanks. It's good for you, mate. You go. You don't want none. <laughs> What about Jane? Does she want salad? Yes, not very much. What do you do then, Roxanne? I work for the council. Got down the doll. No, I'm a road sweeper. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Who's for the potato? She's got my plate. Oh. Yeah, sweetheart. One thing you have to? Yes, please. Yeah, I'll have some of that and all. Thank you. Please. Yeah, you do get girl road sweepers, don't you? Right, burgers and bangers. Nice one. Yeah, that's your one, Roxanne. That's the one with your name on it, the burnt one, all right? Yeah. Would you take the new pot? Please. One? Yeah, darling. <laughs> what for you, Pat? Right, Shall I do you, Monica? I can see to myself, thanks, Cynthia. Why don't you sit down? What about Morris? Who's looking after the worker? Don't worry about me. I've been picking, I'll leave Oops. you. Your potatoes on your trailer, Cynthia. Come on, have some salad. Can I have a chance, please? Oh. Got butter? Yes, just a minute. I have some mustard for you there, Monica. Uh -huh. Oh, you like the American, mm. don't you, Roxanne? Yes, yeah, huh? Do you want some butter, right, right, darling? Just nice. wait for that. There you go, Sim. Oh, Maureen! Well, I'll shut you up. Oh, you having Thanks. a steak, are you, Cynthia? Yes, thank you, Monica. Oh, well, that'll put hairs in your chest. Some mustard, or would you prefer the French? This looks lovely, Morris. Right. Thanks there you go, that. mate. Oh, thanks, Love a cow for you. Look at that. Look at the oh, sausage. That. That's ridiculous. There's enough Jeez. there for all of us. That's got some colour in your cheeks, Paul. Right. You sure no one else wants a steak? Well, don't you have him one? No, he's not, Cynthia. Not allowed. Would you like some mustard, Paul? Oh, lovely. Can't get rid of it, can you? It's a real communal thing, eating. Yes. This is a lovely house. Well, we like it. I'll show you a round later. Yeah, thanks. That would be nice. Yeah, it's brilliant. Do you live in a flat? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Do you live in a flat, then, Hortense? Yeah. Yeah, it's her own. She's got a mortgage and everything. Whereabouts are you? Kilburn. It's a bit of a schlep, isn't it? The old Kemp Road and back every day. Oh. Just she drives! Tube. Drive to the station. You've got a bed sit, ain't you, Paul? Yeah, it's right. Oh, that's a shame. We shy the place we own. Do you still live at home then? No chance. So, do you two work on the same machine? No. I'm the only one on the slits. <laughs> do you choose your own working hours then, Roxanne? Not bloody likely. Just by no time to go to college, aren't you? I ain't going to college. Mm -hmm. Hortense went to college. Mm. What did you study? Optometry. What's that then? To do with the eye, isn't it? That's right. Testing. Mm. And you didn't know all that now, have you? Not exactly. Huh? You're doing working in a cardboard box factory then. There's nothing wrong with her head. I'm doing research. Oh. That's interesting. What sort of research? Medical. What are you looking at her egg? <laughs> <laughs>
take the notice. Everything is okay and not okay. Is this what they call balance? When the feeling of in-between is so strong. This long moment. This feeling that I am still held by. Today I might blink and feel that my eyes are wet and wonder if I have been crying. Numbers haunt me and I stalk them in return. Everything is okay and not okay. Is this what they call balance? When the feeling of between is so strong, they stalk them in return. This long moment, everything is okay and not feeling okay. I am so held by balance. Today I might blink, when the feeling of between is so strong, they stalk me in return. This long moment, everything is okay and not feeling I am so held by balance. Today I might blink, when the feeling of between is so strong, wonder if I have been crying. This long moment, this feeling that I am still held by. Today I might blink and feel that my eyes are wet and I wonder if I have been crying. Everything is okay and not okay. Is this what they call balance? When the feeling of between is so strong, I still come in return. This long moment, everything is okay and not feeling okay. I am just as healthy by balance. Today I might blink and the feeling of my eyes are wet and I wonder if I have been crying. This long moment. This feeling that I am still held by return. Today I might everything is okay and my eyes are wet and wonder if I have been crying. When the feeling of in between is so strong, this long moment, this feeling that I am still held by, today I might blink and feel that my eyes are wet and wonder if I have been crying. Smells that smell like a meeting place between things, between elements. Today I smell my body and I sit in its scents all day. They remind me of something. Numbers haunt me and I stalk them in return. Everything is okay and not okay. Is this what they call balance? When the feeling of is between me, so strong, I stalk them in return. This long moment, everything is okay and not feeling, okay. I am is this what they call balance? I can move balance. towards I myself, blink. when the feeling of around between myself, is so strong, beside myself, inside myself. This long inside moment, myself, this feeling that I am myself. still held by. Today I might blink and feel that my eyes are wet and wonder if I have been crying. It took a long time to arrive. University? Yeah. Did you do a degree? Yes, I did. She just looks at her eyes, don't you? Yes, I do. <laughs> What Today I might blink and feel a wetness in my eyes. Today I might blink and feel a wetness in my eyes. Today I might blink and feel a wetness in my eyes. Can you? When goes to your soul. That's a nice way of putting it, Jane. It's true though, ain't it? Right. Who wants to chop up? Hortense? No thanks. I'm driving. Yes, please, sweetheart. No, Maurice. Oi, greedy guts. <laughs> you want to take a leaf out of her book, Paul? 
lost his license. All right, ma'am. Oh. Just there weren't too many, that's all. There you go. The demon drinky. Is that who you've been going out with then? Yes. She thought I'd been seeing a blow. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been, I suppose. I can still turn a few eggs. Don't stomach. Oh, oh. shit! <laughs> I think it's gone oh. off now. It's just crazy. Did you pop one all tense? Oh, well, we might as well pop them out then. <laughs> no! Oh. Oh. Oh, look at <laughs> Chocolate coated pastry shell filled with ricotta. Chocolate mousse, nine dollars. A sponge base tart, dark and white chocolate mousse. Creme brulee, nine dollars. The creamy custard presented in a traditional ceramic ramekin. Cherry cheesecake, nine dollars. A cookie crust and creamy vanilla cheesecake topped with cherries and a crunchy crumble. Fruit shell. Profiterol, nine dollars. Cream prof filled with chantilly cream and rolled in chocolate. Coconut repenio, nine dollars. Creamy coconut sorbetto, served in natural fruit shell. Dessert menu. Ice cream dessert. Hot fudge sundae, $10.50. Vanilla ice cream, hot fudge, whipped cream. Toasted hazelnut. Old fashioned butterscotch sundae, $10.75. Vanilla and maple walnut ice cream, butterscotch sauce, whipped cream, toasted almonds. Coffee cantata, $10.75. Coffee ice cream, raspberry, hot fudge, whipped cream. Heart of Darkness, chocolate and coffee ice cream, cocoa liqueur, hot fudge, toasted hazelnuts. Garden of the Gods, $10.75. Vanilla and caramel ice cream, essence of passion fruit, apricot and sweet mangoes. Banana split with three sauces, $12.50. With vanilla, espresso and dolce leche ice cream. Local gelati. One scoop for dollars, two scoops seven dollars seventy-five cents. Vanilla chocolate, chocolate, whip. Repeat: vanilla chocolate, chocolate chip, espresso coffee, maple, walnut. Repeat. Repeat.
Jumbo, the Mumbo, the Mumbo, the Jumbo, grab the gun. Jumbo size prize. Last call. Anybody else? Going once, going twice. Anybody else? Okay, everybody get ready. Pick up your gun. Squeeze the trigger. Aim for the grand hole. Sound, sound, sound to the bell. Number four, number four. Pick up your gun. Ready. Ready. Aim and fire in the hole. They go. Squeeze, look at them go, look at them race, look at them chase into the hole and up to the top, who's it going to be? It's number two! Yeah. You're the winner to the prize! You got it, you want it, you got it, number two, take yeah. it away! The jumbo, 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 So hi again, everyone, and thanks so much to Phoebe Calling James for sharing this rare solo release of Walk With Me with us here on The VOV. What a total um, audio-visual escape. Um, otherwise, I guess I'll just quickly round us off here, again, sending such deep gratitude for everyone joining us live for this exciting evening event. The whole heart of collective intimacy harps on a sense of togetherness. So it was really powerful being able to manifest this tonight. And I hope you are all able to relax and enjoy the past two hours of programming. And should you wish to explore our virtual exhibition and the 10 other immersive video works a bit further, it's open for free on the volve.art until Monday, July 12th. So please don't miss out. And again, the VOV uses virtual reality to bring artworks to life alongside an astounding program of events with direct access to curators and artists behind all the projects, both on demand and live like we are tonight now. Um, also a part of the VOV's mission is to reach new and wider audiences by enabling access to all this exciting creative content and to also facilitate contributions that financially benefit public museums and galleries. So if you're interested, please donate online. And again, note that everything is split equally amongst the participating institutions. Um, so I guess another huge thank you um, first to my team at the showroom for so bravely and diligently working to expand our archive in new ways and the VOV for making this all possible. We really admire and value your team's innovative and collaborative ethos. Um, finally, a big thank you to all the artists who joined us live tonight. Blaze, Julia Knox, Chinasa, Elvira, Sis, and Phoebe. 
um, to activate collective intimacy. And of course, the greater group of individuals and collectives who've been a part of the original program and the growing community that it entails. Um, it's, it's such an honor and a true pleasure to be able to continue communicating and celebrating in new ways together. So cheers, and I hope you all have a great night. Bye.